Hi, and welcome to ComiCast, the podcast that talks about the stuff that matters to you. This is the first of two podcasts about public ownership and it's important. Public ownership is in the press a lot more now due to the current scandal of rising energy prices, the somewhat neglected scandal of rising water prices and the abuse of that most fundamental resource as a vehicle for financial engineering and the rolling scandal of a railway industry that refuses to pay its workers properly after paying out significant dividends to its shareholders and receiving a public subsidy of around five billion pounds per annum. But public ownership has a bad reputation. Every time it's mentioned as a potential solution, you hear someone on the right make some pompous sneer on the lines of, oh, that went well last time, didn't it? That poor performance has become part of an accepted, received economic history along with the 1970s having been an economic disaster from which Thatcher saved us. The reality is that real economic growth was higher in the 70s than it was in the 80s, despite the 70s featuring two oil shocks and the collapse of the international monetary system at its outset. And unemployment was half what it became in the 80s and North Sea oil benefits were minimal then compared to Thatcher's decade. So. Things are much more complicated than they are made to seem by right-wing propaganda. And that is also true for the history of the publicly owned industries. In this first podcast, we're going to talk about that history. Next time, we're going to focus on the type of public ownership that we want to see in the future, its priorities and its purpose. First, over to Robert Wilkinson. Rob, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, about the achievements individually and collectively of the publicly owned industries in the post-war years. First, before you answer, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please, sir. Yeah, my name is Robert Wilkinson. I'm a graduate of Sussex University back in the old days of the 1970s. I ended up in teaching and got to the level of the National Executive of the National Union of Teachers. Um, I was teaching history, sociology, economics, business studies, and the International Baccalaureate in the end. So I think that was quite a wide range of subjects. Okay, Rob, thanks very much indeed. And um, to kick off, what do you think were the main achievements, individually and collectively, of the publicly owned industries in the post-war years? And not just the fact that up until this year, fuel prices were 50% lower in real terms before privatization and water prices were 40% lower. So apart from charging people a reasonable whack for important public utilities, what were the main achievements of those industries? Well, by 1945, uh, it was evident that much of the industrial base of Britain was in a very sorry state. And that as a consequence of a lack of investment that had been quite long term going back to Victorian times. British finance capital had sought higher returns from investments abroad and largely neglected that at home. And yet the two world wars of the 20th century had required the state to intervene in the direction of industry in order to wage effectively total war against Germany. So what Britain desperately needed by 1945 was an extensive programme of capital investment that private enterprise was not prepared to finance. Now I'd like to talk as an example of uh, the railways. Uh, that's always been an interest of mine. And uh, I think it's uh, very, very much the point of issue at the moment too. I mean, the, 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 before 1945, uh, there were four railway companies, and that itself was a consequence of state-sponsored amalgamations arising out of the First World War. But by 1945, those four private railway companies, further modernization and recovery from the war were beyond their means. So the creation of British railways on the foundation of a regional administration enabled the upgrading of rolling stock and improvements to the track and electronic signaling. And that only gave returns on a long-term basis. So you can see why private enterprise wasn't really interested. So 
The replacement of steam engines with diesel and electric powered locomotives and multiple units was a resounding success. So British Railways, as it was, served the recovery post-war of the industrial production extremely well, despite the extension of car ownership and containerization of heavy vehicle lorries that took much business away from the railways onto state subsidized roads and infrastructure. Unfortunately, though, the beaching acts and privatization has destroyed much of the potential for an environmentally friendly network of transport infrastructure, of integrated rail, road, air, canal, river and coastal traffic as part of a national plan, which I think is where we should be headed. Absolutely, and that's very important from an environmental point of view as well. Okay, now let's go over to uh, a man who in many ways needs no introduction, but I'm going to ask him to give one anyway. John Foster, tell us about yourself there, please, sir. Hello, I'm a retired academic um, and also always a, a member of my union, which was uh, for the last period of employment, the Institute, uh, Educational Institute of Scotland, of which I'm a life member. So I'm very proud of that. I've written quite widely on economic and social history. Um, that gives me some insight into the way in which privatization and public ownership of industries was used by governments during the 20th century. The first thing I'd like to stress is the degree to which publicly owned industries go back a very long way. Royal Mail goes back 500 years, Naval Dockyards 400, they were the leading way of uh, innovation in the industry, and even pet British Petroleum before the First World War. Uh, rails and coal were both nationalized during the First World War, and during those years, there was no talk of inefficiency. In fact, uh, during the 1930s, uh, British Petroleum, then Anglo-Iranian oil, 51% uh, publicly owned, was paying dividends of near 10% to its private investors. Now, since 1945, there is no real statistical evidence that public ownership of industries in Britain was less efficient than similar industries in private ownership elsewhere in America or in Europe. P Professor Malcolm Sawyer did quite important uh, international comparative work on this and found that the levels of profits, if this is one measure, were virtually the same. Um, and even this comparison didn't take account, and I think Robert has already made this point, of the way in which cut price, price uh, gas, electricity, coal, steel, and transport were used as hidden subsidies for private industrial users in the 1940s and 50s in order to boost Britain's export industries. So um, that didn't show up in the figures because nobody really knew about it. Other more recent research by MIT, uh, Professor Florio Massimo has identified another key difference one which we now know in a bit more detail. Private investors, as I think Robert also said, did not invest. They didn't even maintain the basic levels required for public service. They cherry-picked, got rid of key engineering skills, and shamelessly neglected safety. That was exposed in the railway industry with the disastrous crashes in the 1990s. We've seen it exposed in water supply over the last few years with leakages and contamination, making our environmental system dangerous. And it was exposed in power generation over the last two years, a totally dysfunctional system with a reg regulator co-opted by the owners and ownership now almost entirely external. It's very easy to make profits in an essential service if you don't invest. At the same time, it's also important to stress what was achieved by these industries before privatization. It wasn't just that they provided an essential service, both to the economy and to uh, those who lived and worked in Britain. It was their role in innovation and research. We tend to forget just how much was achieved. The world's first commercial nuclear power station 
was developed at Calder Hall by the Central Electricity Generating Board in the 1940s. It then went on to develop the world's, one of the world's first advanced gas cooler reactors. Then you look at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, another publicly owned research um, entity that developed the jet engine, carbon fiber, and space satellites. And then you've got the successful development of the revolutionary RB211 jet engine, uh, largely completed after Rolls-Royce had been taken into public ownership because private management failed it. Much of the early pioneering work in the North Sea was also done by British Gas in the 1960s. Our situation today would be transformed if we had adopted the Norwegian model of state ownership. Stat Oil, uh, the publicly owned Norwegian company, ensured that their reserves weren't looted and flared off. Today, we would, if we'd have done that, have massive continuing reserves controlled by the state, which they have in Norway. So there's no evidence that the private enterprise is less efficient than the private sector. The balance is the other way. Produced key innovations and enabled a high level of an economic growth in the 1940s and 50s. There are, however, other issues in terms of top management, government policy, and the relationship with the private sector that were not so effective or good and caused a great deal of problems. I think we'll come back to this later. We definitely will. Yeah, thanks very much for that, John. You mentioned British Gas there. I want to talk about something myself here, which uh, all three of us are old enough to remember, but the vast majority of people listening probably aren't, which is the great conversion from town gas to natural gas. Now, this was basically when they discovered natural gas in the North Sea, they were able to affect a massive transformation away from what was pretty dangerous uh, coal-based town gas to the natural stuff. Now, the great switch was led by the government and the publicly owned energy companies. A serious priority was recognized. Short term profitability and keeping the shareholders happy was not a concern and the speed and efficiency of the operation was massively impressive. Basically, this went, this took place between 1968 and 1976. Just eight years to change a whole system from one fuel to another. They converted about 40 million appliances for 40 million customers, mostly households, uh, and they reached the peak of, I think, 2.3 million a year conversions in the 1970s, which caused a huge reduction in carbon emissions due to the extreme carbon inefficiency of the fuels were, that were replaced. Now, this exercise was, in the words of Sir Dennis Rook, who, my God, is no socialist, a chairman of British Gas from 76 until 1989, he described it as perhaps the greatest peacetime operation in the nation's history. Uh, and also an industry I used to work uh, with a while too, British Steel. British Steel had some massive problems in the late 70s, but they were basically the problems of overcapacity in the industry. If you look at the, the Davignon report here, it's quite interesting. This came out from the European Union in the uh, mid 1970s. And they say that the worldwide steel problem was brought about by uh, the economic recession, over consumption reduction, and by overcapacity, the result of heavy investment during the euphoria of the years of economic growth. So it's good to see the European Union uh, justifying some elements of Marxist economics then. Now, the steel industry recovered in this country under public ownership. I was with DTI whenever this happened, the old Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, and the industry was turned around into something they were able to sell. And unfortunately, after it was sold, it got diminished considerably. And we are where we are now. A guy called Brian Moffat famously said uh, whenever they did a big deal with a Dutch company and reduced the number of people in the industry by serious amounts, he was in the business of making money, not steal, which I think is a pretty interesting comment on current capitalism. OK, um, now let's uh, go to Rob, please. Rob, what do you think were the main problems in the way the publicly owned industries were run over the course of their history? And what lessons does this analysis provide for our future program of public ownership? It's certainly the case that uh, the lack of competition may lead to 
what some people have called monopoly complacency and the aversion to innovation and risk taking. But the success of enterprises in the public sector requires effective political direction. It won't happen by itself. Effective political direction and public scrutiny. And I think it's those two factors that were perhaps lacking to a serious extent during the 1950s. Large nationalized corporations may become far removed from the people that they are meant to serve. It's far better to devolve the administration and supervision to regional and more local levels. Secondly, the requirement to break even over a longer period still makes a constraint on the quality of service to the consumer. It's far better to accept that utilities and public services are a benefit to society as a whole. Society needs to accept that the priority is effective service rather than cost accounting, much like perhaps the emergency services or the armed services are not required to run at a profit. And so there are those two factors, I think, the, the, the trying to run the industries from Whitehall, uh, the fact that the political direction wasn't really as competent as it needed to be, and then the financial constraint to try and, if not make a profit, at least break even. And I think we've got to accept that if the public utilities are going to be run as a public service, then that kind of accounting is inappropriate. And we've got to see it as something that you can't put a price on, if you like, people's health and the lives of old age pensioners over the winter. You can't put a price on that. It's, it's something that has a value to everybody, I hope, but you can't put a price on it. And I think it's, in, it's wrong for us to expect public services like gas and electricity and water to break even. It's not possible and in a way shouldn't be necessary. Yeah, that's certainly very relevant given the current problems and what John said earlier about stat oil in Norway. You have uh, uh, privately run companies here making a fortune. They've done nothing to deserve it. They just got a windfall from the increase in wholesale gas prices and passing it on to people um, who can't afford to pay it. And um, unfortunately, this winter, people will die as a result, despite some of the inadequate measures which the government has taken against it. Rob, thanks for that. Uh, John, over to you. What's your view on that question, sir? Yes, so there's a host of issues here in terms of management and control. Um, and I think they go back to the type of government that introduced public ownership in 1945. It was a Labour government, uh, and it was elected um, by an electorate that wanted to see change that saw public ownership of industry as more important than beverage and the welfare state, because it was about power and control, about the power of working people against the old order. All the studies of the election in 1945 see that as what people wanted. But the post-war Labour government was not really about this, although it contained a number of left-wingers, such as an Aaron Bevan, it was dominated by the right wing. Key figures were Ernest Bevin and Herbert Morrison. They were both Cold War warriors, strong supporters of the colonial system, both opponents of right wing, uh, of rank and file movements uh, in their own uh, unions and areas. And they were responsible for the banning of unofficial strikes right up until 1951. That was the character of the government. And that was reflected in the power dynamics of the new nationalized industries. The old existing managements were simply carried forward 
Existing disciplinary codes were maintained. The old owners were paid massive compensation for deadbeat assets and shop stewards excluded. So it was state ownership from the top down, as Robert has said, state ownership by a capitalist and an imperialist state still fighting colonial wars across the world. And although the new industries did harness progressive enthusiasm, this had little weight in terms of overall decision-making from the top. It was very bureaucratized and there was interference all the time from uh, the cabinet and key uh, government agencies. Some of the problems were about pricing, as I think I've already mentioned, particularly the way wholesale, wholesale pricing was used to subsidize the private sector. Others were about contracting out to the private sector. As in the National Health Service, private companies leached off the public sector, and the way they did so was largely close to private scrutiny. The fact that nationalized industries did as well as they did is a tribute, really, to some of the better management of that day and to the workers within those industries. And for the future, we need to learn the lessons, lessons about democratic control, as Rob has already um, emphasized. Labour's manifestos under Corbyn provide some of the answers in terms of trade union representatives on management committees and boards so that workers are directly represented by people who they in turn have elected. But we also need to think about how to establish wider democratic control and responsibility at a number of levels, locally, at the community where the uh, industries are based, at the level of regions and Scotland and the Welsh Parliament, where workers live and where production and employment is critical for developing the wider regional economies and its skills. Most of all, we need to develop the power of a politically mobilized mass trade union movement committed to advancing public ownership and to ensure a different type of state, one that does serve the people and not the interests of private capital. Thank you, John. Uh, Rob, over to you. Um, do you think it's fair to say that the post-war nationalisations, they were more about rationalising some sectors that were ailing, particularly coal and rail, rather than being genuinely owned and ran in the interests of the people? Do you think that's a fair characterisation? Yes, um, although we've got to recognise that there were certain, I don't know whether you'd call them nationalisations, but certainly working in the education section, uh, what happened post-war was almost like a nationalisation of um, secondary education. But it all came from the Beveridge Report, I think, that... Uh, it was accepted, beverage report on social services, welfare, was accepted across the political spectrum. Although it was notable that Churchill didn't like it and Churchill's reluctance may have cost him the election, served him right, of course, that's fine. But certainly it wasn't just industries like rail and, and uh, the docks and canal transport and everything that, that required reorganisation. Health and education did too. And I think uh, it was done in order to deliver the promises made to a generation who were very much aware of how their parents had been betrayed in 1918 by Lloyd George and this homes fit for heroes promises. We got to recognise that in 1945, the people in the armed forces were much more politically conscious than ever before. Their service in the army and in the armed forces had developed a political consciousness, partly through study sessions and things like that, but also they had an awareness of politics that was quite unprecedented, I believe. Also, the women had played a greater role in society 
during the Second World War than their mothers had been in the previous war, even though obviously women did play a part in the First World War, not to the same extent. Uh, that they had been in the Second World War. So the political consciousness of women was, was raised, as well as that of the uh, armed forces. So when it came down to it, the balance of class forces was such that their social aspirations had to be fulfilled. So I think there is that element to the post-war nationalisation, not just, if you like, the needs for investment in the service of industry. There was also a demand for improved working conditions and welfare from organized workers in key industries, such as the mines and railways that had played a vital role during the war. Now their demands couldn't be ignored by the government. However, if we look at the situation dialectically, dialectically we have to recognize the continuing truth of Engels' remarks on the nationalization carried out by Bismarck in Imperial Germany. And this is what he said, the transformation either into joint stock companies or into state ownership does not do away with the capitalistic nature of the productive forces. The modern state, no matter what its form, is essentially a capitalist machine the state of the capitalist, the ideal personification of the total national capital. So we could say that really the state intervention that existed throughout the 20th century, up until, if you like, the 1980s, was partly a consequence of imperious rivalry, the rivalry between Britain and Germany, going all the way back to the pre-1914 naval race, uh, you know, who can build more ships, uh, Britain or Germany. <coughs> but by 1945, there was a much more significant contribution as to what was happening. And that was the battle between socialism and capitalism. I think when it came down to it, the existence of uh, the welfare provision in the Soviet Union and then into the people's democracies in Eastern Europe was something that the capitalists in Britain and elsewhere knew that they had to emulate it in order to fulfill um, some of the people's desires for social change. So I think there's those two elements in the nationalization program. <coughs> the needs of industry for state investment, if you like, the capital investment in the ailing industries, but also a need to appease the working class with a different form of capitalism. But yeah, that's an interesting point. And uh, certainly since the demise of the Soviet Union and the people's democracies from the early 90s, this is a capitalism which hasn't really given a damn. Yeah, good point. We'll talk about that a little bit more maybe in the next podcast. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, John, over to you. Any more comments on that? And can I also have your closing comments before we have to finish, please? I think Rob has taken this very well towards the conclusion. Um, Nationalisation within capitalism is important. It can reflect, as in 1945, the balance of class forces and the need of a ruling class to meet the expectations of voters. But it also, in those circumstances, as I think has been fully explained, can be used for quite different purposes and not fulfill the expectations that were put upon it. And that was certainly the case, not the expectations of working people. It did operate relatively efficiently. It did have an amazing level of uh, ability to develop um, innovation. Uh, it did operate efficiently, but it didn't ultimately represent the type of public ownership uh, that was being developed in socialist countries. And we've seen all kinds of 
of experiments in terms of uh, it being carried forward in the Soviet Union, where um, I think most people would say, uh, most economists would say, now, having studied it, that we've seen there the fastest process of industrialization, as also was the case in China. So um, there are differences between the socialist system, whatever the imperfections may be, and the capitalist system in the way in which public ownership is used or state ownership is used. And that is something I think that it is essential that um, all socialists win an understanding of uh, over the coming period. We have to win an understanding that if we're going to go forward and rescue our economy, which is it today in the most desperate state I think it's ever been for, for monopolization and financialization, if we're going to rescue it as a society, then there has to be a much more fundamental change than simply taking things into public ownership in the way in which it happened in 1945. We need a change in the entire nature of the state and the balance of class forces. And that can only be done by the mass of the people in this country who have no capital, who have no vested interests in being one to understand what has to be done. And that's the job of uh, us as socialists. Well, thanks very much indeed. That's fixed it up quite nicely, I think, for uh, the next uh, episode. I think it's also very important that um, we talk, this isn't just a matter of taking over industry. This is actually repurposing the whole point, uh, the whole motivation of economic activity. Uh, Rob, uh, give us your closing comments, please, sir. Well, I think, as Engels said, um, nationalisation was a change in the form of capitalism. But the content was still there. The profit motive, the drive for productivity as well as production was still there. And I think in, in that sense, what has happened with privatization has not just reversed some of the gains that were actually made uh, post-1945, but it's actually created a major problem for capitalism itself that privatization doesn't work for capitalism and i think in that sense what we're trying to do in advocating what some people call renationalization but i think we should get away from that and talk about social ownership and control and i think it's that control that we need to think about uh, much more, that the form of ownership isn't as important for the control that can be exercised over business, whether in the private or the public sector, by political forces. And that is why I think the British Road for Socialism is so important in identifying the political forces that are required in order to control capitalism in one way or another. Brilliant, thanks very much indeed. Okay, quick preview of the next podcast in this series. We're gonna be informed by the lessons of history. We turn to the public ownership of the future, the purpose of the new public entities, how they're managed and how both the purpose and management can dovetail with agreed economic priorities and plans how the public entities can repurpose economic activity and our attitude to that activity. This isn't just about a bunch of unrelated state-run companies looking to maximize the accumulation of capital and exploit their monopoly power. And uh, getting back to what the guys were saying earlier, we're going to look to answer the question posed by Che Guevara during a much neglected phase of his career when he began the process of building socialism in Cuba how to centralize without obstruction of initiative and how to decentralize without losing control and perhaps create a new man under socialism. A lot of big topics there. We're going to be talking about them in the next Comicast uh, with Rob and also with John. Comrades, thank you very much indeed.
This has been Comicast. We are anti-fascist, anti-racist, very much pro-public ownership. Good night and thanks very much for listening. Cheers.